Hi everyone, welcome to Commotion Labs Fundamentals for Startups. My name is Ashley Esteban and I'm the Associate Director. Fundamentals for Startups is our regular lecture series open to anyone interested in learning about entrepreneurship or building a startup. Each week we feature experts from various fields who bring you insights and inspiration and give you the opportunity to ask questions. All sessions are recorded and archived on Commotion's website. Next week, Karen Kidder, partner of First Row Partners, will present Early Stage Investing 101. This talk will be virtual, so tune in online. And for our full schedule, you can register for fundamentals um, at bit.ly forward slash commotion fundamentals. Commotion Labs is a multi-industry incubator program hosting early stage startups from both inside and outside the university. We are committed to nurturing and, in and enabling success through critical infrastructure, training, mentoring, and networking. And we do this without taking any equity or IP. We operate out of three locations on campus, each with its own industry focus, life sciences and hardware in Fluke Hall, and our technology incubator, which is based in Startup Hall. If you're a founder looking for somewhere to thrive, we'd love to talk to you. Today, we are proud to partner with BECU to present a FinTech Fundamentals for Startups presentation. See how BECU, Washington's largest not-for-profit not credit union, is helping grow the fintech community and inspire innovation in the Pacific Northwest. On behalf of BECU, welcome to the FinTech-related Fundamentals for Startups today. My name is Alicia DeLessi. I'm the Product Manager of Innovation here at BECU. And I'd just like to open up by saying that BECU is uniquely focused on offering long-term solutions to support the financial well-being of our members and our communities. Our partnership with CoMotion helps us do that. Emerging technologies have the potential to both benefit and disrupt our members' sense of security and control, and we're committed to being the forefront of innovation in the financial services space. BECU has partnered with Comotion over the last four years to support the growth of fintech in the Puget Sound area. To date, we've supported 19 fintech startups through the BECU Fintech Incubator and have offered grants through the fintech track of the Comotion Innovation Gap Fund. We've learned so much through this collaboration and would like to announce that applications are now open for our next round of uh, FinTech cohort incubator for the 2023-2024 year. Feel free to use the QR code screen, or excuse me, QR code you see on the screen um, to get loaded to the application process. Today I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Lisa Goldshire. She's here to present Credit Union's Tech Partnerships, Applying Lessons Learned to Startup Life. Lisa's the Chief Strategy Officer for ASA, a company embracing a new form of open banking, where banks and credit unions maintain ownership and control over customer member data in a safe, secure environment and provide financial empowerment through individualized choice. Today, Lisa will discuss her unique experience working with financial institutions and fintech providers, guiding them through strategy, market research, evaluations, and ongoing partnerships. She'll discuss key considerations for engaging with credit unions and how she utilizes her skill set to help scale BECU fintech incubator startup with ASA. I'm now going to turn the event over to Lisa.
Thank you, Alicia. I'm just waiting for our slides to come up. Um, as we do that, I'm, today I'm going to share with you some insights uh, that I have garnered through my unique experience in the financial services industry. Um, initially, this uh, presentation was really tailored to really early stage startups. However, there are points in this conversation that I hope that will be applicable to you no matter where you are within that journey. I started my banking career at US Bank, and I was fortunate enough to have a number of different positions with them that when I was there. That pro provided me with perspective into a number of different areas, in including marketing, sales, account acquisition, retail, and small business and, and uh, commercial lending. Uh, I also was, it was able to work with US Bank on what most of us in this room would consider the not so fun side of banking, which is operations, risk, and compliance. Uh, I moved from US Bank over to the American Bankers Association. In my role there, I headed up uh, business innovation for them. I evaluated hundreds of fintech providers, and uh, through those evaluations as an association, we then ended up par forming partnerships. Uh, my role with those partnerships was really to be a strategic advisor, helping those fintechs understand the financial services marketplace, and also helping them gain market share. I worked closely with strategic advisors and consultants within the industry, gaining insight from them and sharing insight back with them. And then uh, really one of my most favorite parts of my job at, at the ABA was working with CEOs and their teams within financial organizations. They were strategic advisors to me, sharing what worked for them and what didn't work within the industry. And I was able to help them as far as looking at their patterns for technology adoption, what we were seeing within the marketplace as far as technology, marketplace trends, and where they should be heading. Through that work, I learned a lot about uh, innovation and lack thereof within the financial marketplace. And really what it led to was a lack for a lot of these institutions as far as having a strategy. So I was able to take a step back and work very closely with them as far as what does innovation look like within their organization and how do they put together a strategy and create a culture of innovation within their institutions. So having been in the market and seen the challenges that there are between fintechs and financial institutions as far as partnering and integrating new technology, I was very excited when I met a company called ASA. When I found them, I realized that they solve a lot of these challenges that are taking place within the market. And so I left my role at ABA in April of 2022 and joined the team of ASA to help them bring this solution to market. It's just a little bit about me and why I'm here talking with you today. Uh, when we're talking about partnerships and looking at what works and what doesn't work, it's really important as you're coming to market to make sure that you understand the market. Uh, as a fintech, really be clear about the problem that you are trying to solve when you go to market and understand who else within that marketplace is also solving that problem. I had fintechs call me up that had already developed a product. They take me through the demo and I would say to them, uh, do you realize that you have to connect into the financial institution's core in order to bring this to market? And they would say, what's a core? They didn't understand the technology and what the, what the financial institutions have in place and what it means to have to integrate in with that. They also may not have realized that that product was already being offered through their core processor. And while that product may not be as good as what they were bringing to market, they have the stiff road of competition ahead from them with somebody who's already in the market. And a number of them, as I looked at their products, I would say to them, there are four or five other people who are also bringing this to market at the same time, and they weren't aware of that. So I know that sounds really basic, but it is really important and imperative to do the research to understand who your competition is, whether they're inside or outside of the financial services marketplace, so that you know as you're bringing your product to market uh, who, who your competitors are and also what the financial institution may be hearing from others. When fintechs first came to market, there was a lot of talk about disruption. Fintechs were really trying to take market share away from financial institutions. It was called great disruptors, the disruptive marketplace, fintechs as disruptors. 
As you think about your strategy and how you're going to market, luckily that has changed and a lot of us are looking to partner and I'm sure most of you in the room are looking at that as a partnership. Really make sure though that that is how you're thinking and that you're passionate about being in this industry. Your passion will come through when you're talking with financial institution, that resonates and that means a lot to them. There is somewhat of a hangover from that disruptor mentality and so if you can really come to them and talk to them about how you want to partner and work with them in order to meet their account holders needs Needs. It's not about who's going to do it best. It's about how are we as partners going to do it best together. Financial institutions are not all the same. We often are looked at grouping them together based on asset size. So when you're asked what is your target market and going to market, one of the easier ways to do it is to look at asset size and break financial institutions up into that. That's fine and that is a good way to look at your market. Understand though that within, that, within the asset size, financial institutions are not all the same. They have a different ways of going to market. They have a different uh, people that they're going after as far as within the market. So are they small business focused? Are they commercial focused? Are they retail focused? Are they ag focused? You really need to make sure that you understand that. Uh, how, what is their culture within that organization? Uh, take the time to listen to them and to understand they're small business owners. They do want to talk to you about their business. Take the time to do that, to learn from them, and then to understand how your product may or may not meet their needs. So within an asset size, you may meet some of their needs, but not, not all of their needs. So just make sure that you understand that and the problem that you're solving for each. And you may actually find that your problem can be adaptable to a, a financial institution that you didn't think that it was going to be. So listen to what they're saying and see if you can adapt. Really think about your revenue model and runway. I've had fintechs come to me again and they're saying, Lisa, how should we price? And I'm thinking, I just saw your product. <laughs> I'm not the one who should be telling you how to price. You should have done research within this space and understand what pricing looks like. You know your product better than I do. What is it going to take for you to be a profitable company? One thing to really look at, especially if you're going after the community uh, financial institution space, is implementation fees. I've seen companies come and say, we're going to charge $100,000 as an implementation fee. That will not work in this space. They do not, financial institutions, especially the community ones, do not have the budgets to be able to afford or to do that. So if that's part of your business model, you really need to rethink that. I'm going to read this point, which I normally don't up on my slides because it's such an important one. It will take you longer to go to market than you think. I have seen so many pro formas and so many revenue projections. I don't know that I've ever seen one is that it hit the mark as far as being in market when they thought they were. So realize that, know that this is a challenging industry. It's a fantastic industry, but it will take you longer to go to market than you think. I don't know how many of you have heard that the kind of new buzzword lately is culture eats strategy for lunch. Uh, when you're a fintech, it's really important to understand that culture is an important part of who you are as a fintech organization. We're all so busy, we're developing product, we're trying to go to market, we're doing shifts, right? Uh, every day could be something new as far as a pivot that we're doing. Have you taken the time within your organization to understand and define what your culture is. If you haven't, please do so. Really important for you to know that because as you go into this space, you want to understand what the financial institution's culture is. And you wanna make sure that you line up if you are going to go into partnership. Are they an agile organization? Are they able to pivot or not pivot? How do they look at product development and a product roadmap? Understand those things because those are all part of culture and how you work with the organization. It's okay if your cultures don't fit. Find that out early. It's really hard when you go through product development with a financial institution and later find out your cultures don't fit. That will stop you dead in your tracks and you could have found that out early on. So take the time to have those conversations. Really look at the problem that is being solved. We all know what problem we're solving, right? We developed products to be able to do that. We're very passionate about the products that we have. When you're talking to a financial institution, it's very easy to get excited about what we're solving. What we need to do is make sure that we really listen to them and understand the problem they want us to solve. 
They may agree with us in the first couple of meetings, and as you get further down the road, you find out they were just agreeing and it's really a different problem they want to solve, and now we have to backtrack. Have those conversations early, and again, really make sure you're listening to them. They may not even know what the problem is they're trying to solve, and a lot of times that happens, and through conversations, you can pull that out. And then adjust and shift as you need to, as you're looking at what that problem is. And really understand their approach to third parties and to partnerships. So have they done them before? Uh, what has worked, what has not worked? Are they an organization that likes to really partner with their core provider or their online provider and get technology through them, but they're reaching out to you to, just to learn more, or are they really interested in partnering with you? Are they really going to partner with you, or, or are they going to do the fallback, what they consider safe, and go through their, their, one of their providers? Are they looking at doing more of a referral model? You offer the product, they refer people to you. Right? Are they looking at co-developing and have they done that before? So there, we use the term partnership in general, but there are many different forms that it can take. So again, take time to really think about and understand what they mean by partnership and how they approach them. Integrations, um, big sigh in the room as we start to talk about integrations. Uh, lots of challenges, as I mentioned, involved with integrations as we go through those. Uh, as you're going into it, though, there are a number of steps that you can take to make integrations easier. You really need to talk with the team that you're working with to understand if you integrate into, again, their, maybe it's their online banking provider, how will that impact other systems that they have? Is there an impact for their loan operating system? Is there something that you're going to connect to that's going to impact a process in another area? Um, what, is, what are all the challenges that could happen? Many financial institutions have had to create their own processes or workarounds. Uh, so just because you integrated with one one way doesn't mean that it's going to work another way within another financial institution. Have those conversations early and upfront and involve different business units in different lines so that you understand everything that is invo involved with their technology systems and their technology stack. Along those lines, don't expect everything to be one size fits all. We wish it were, it is not. I have never heard the word seamless integration, even though I have them up here. I have never heard them used by a financial institution. Fintechs, we like to use those words, but from a financial institution, you will never hear seamless integration. I'm going to talk a little bit more about vocabulary and the differences between fintechs and financial institutions. When it comes to seamless integration on the fintech side, we can say that we think it's seamless. Understand it is never seamless on the financial institution side. There are many things that come into factor for them, and many people within who are doing the integration are wearing many different hats, so there, there are competing priorities coming at them. Um, so just be aware of that. What worked at one financial institution might not necessarily work at the next, so as you're building out timelines and looking at things, just understand that they will vary. It's not a bad thing, it's just something to be aware of to know as you're going to market. Relationships are so important as part of the partnership that you're developing. So having the product and the technology that you're going to market with is one piece of it. It's really developing that relationship, though, and building that out throughout the organization as much as you can. And it all starts with trust. As I mentioned early on, talking about disruptors within the marketplace, a lot of financial institutions remember that. They remember that fintechs were coming and trying to go after their market, and some succeeded, a number of them didn't. That is still, as I mentioned before, kind of a hangover effect, though, within the marketplace. So you're already walking into that type of a situation with some of the financial institutions. There are others who are already past that and are more willing to do that, but you just need to be aware that that is an environment you can be walking into. So you really need to work closely with your points of contacts at the financial institution in order to develop their trust. And one way to do this is to really be an advisor to them. Again, as I mentioned, they're wearing many hats and they are really trying to keep up with what's happening in the industry. However, a, a lot of people, especially depending on the size of the organization, 
are not able to attend conferences, to read as much as they want, to go to every webinar that's out there, to attend all the online uh, courses that are available. You can serve in that role if they're willing and, and, and don't mind you sending them uh, you know, things that you've heard within the industry, sharing different insights with them. And not just about your product, about the industry, what you've heard, what you learned at a conference, a couple key takeaways. Uh, they will normally be very open to that. You can also help them if they have to put together a presentation, maybe it's for the board or for other lines of business within the financial institution. Offer to gather information for them, uh, give them statistics, give them things that might help them along the journey. And then also let them be an advisor to you. We all have a lot to learn from our financial institutions. They understand their space within the market. They can, they know regulatory compliance, risk, operations. Let them uh, tell you, let them teach you what it is that they need from you and then help them by providing them with the information that they need. Uh, now we get to really my favorite part of this, which is talking about the language differences. Um, I mentioned integrations and, and what that can mean. Um, when we talk, there are a number of words up here and there are a number that I didn't put up here. Uh, one that I really like to pull out is fast. Uh, for those in, your, in the room, as far as the FinTech, what would you define as fast? Anybody just throw out up? Okay, next week? Instant, Instant okay. Uh, do we have any financial institutions in the room? What, what would you define as fast in your organization? PEC. PEC, okay. Okay, you guys may be faster, but we'll see. Well, no, I don't okay. know. Okay. So, so I would say, like, you know, three months would be very fast. Six months would be very, you know, three to six months would be really fast. Yeah. And I'd say for most organizations, two years would be very fast, uh, especially when it comes to implementing a product. So as you're talking about fast, you could both agree, let's move fast. You're going to have two very different people on either side of the table, though, when one realizes fast was three to six to two years, and the other side thought fast was instant or a week. So really be aware of those terms as you're using them and, and what they mean so that you're setting realistic expectations. Uh, we, uh, when I was at the American Bankers Association, we wanted to research uh, commercial and consumer digital lending products. So really products in which uh, the technology would allow the financial institution to use their underwriting guidelines, but to speed up the process as far as uh, how they were working. There were a number of different technologies coming to market, and this is back in 2016. So we talked with, uh, with financial institutions, we held focus groups, we did surveys, we did one-on-one -on -one conversations, we had an advisory council. Everybody said, yes, this is top of mind for us, we want you to go out and research the marketplace. In fact, we'd like you to do more than that. We want you to endorse a product or service, let us know about it, bring it to market because we want to use this technology. We endorsed providers in 2017. By 2018, we had very little uptake. So we started looking at that. We said, we can't figure this out. You all told us you wanted this. You said it was important to the industry. We brought it to market, and nobody's implementing it. Uh, what, do you guys th what do you think we missed in, in the questions that we were asking up front? Fast. Pardon me? Fast. Fast was one, yes. Anybody else? They said they wanted it, fast gets to it. What we didn't ask was, you want it for the industry, would you use this at your financial institution? Would you put this on your technology roadmap? And then we didn't ask from there, if you would put it on your technology roadmap, do you have buy-in from others within the organization? Well, we're talking about changing a commercial loan process that involves specific loan officers and their systems and what they use and how they go to market. That is a tough area to try to change. And without buy-in from the top of the organization and bringing that down, because it implements a lot of processes along the way. So we didn't ask that. The key question we didn't ask was when. When would you put this in place? So they all said they wanted it, but we didn't ask them when they would implement it. If we would have asked, we might have found out it would be five years. So we were way ahead of the market as, as far as coming into market with this technology. And we don't mind being ahead of the market, but in this case, we were a little too early. 
So it's very tough for the fintech to stick around for five years to wait for a financial institution to implement their technology. So as you're looking at that, again, this gets to terminology. Really make sure that you understand and ask all the right questions as far as implementation and when it's going to happen. Uh, Ron Shevlin from Cornerstone Advisors just put out his What's Going On in Banking research report. And um, this question was specifically related to banks. And I think it was such a low percentage, maybe 20%. This is in 2022, getting back to looking at, at this business application, we're looking at either implementing or changing uh, that process. So we were looking at it in 2017. In 2022, still a small part of the market is looking at doing that. So lesson learned. Uh, going kind of taking that as far as time to market. When working with a financial institution, understand that things move really quickly. And by really quickly, in this case, I mean it can be, I need your due diligence binder, I need your product specs, I need all this, I need it by tomorrow. So that can happen. You may not hear back from that financial institution for two weeks or three weeks. And you have to be okay with that. It's easy to get super frustrated. We put all this work into getting this to them. And are they even reading it? Are they even looking at it? Yes, they are. Right? They have competing priorities. And you got it to this business unit, who now needs to take it to another business unit, who now needs to wait for compliance to weigh in, who, by the way, legal needs to now say something. And we have to see how it impacts operations over here. So it's not that it's not being worked on or that things aren't happening. It's easy on the FinTech side to get frustrated with that as far as jumping through a hoop. Really, again, this comes back to that relationship. Feel free to keep in touch with your line of business person that you're working with in your contact, but don't overwhelm them with emails every day asking them where they are and why they haven't gotten back to you. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I do want to go back to this talking about um, involving key areas early. Uh, it's really exciting to be involved on the business side of bringing a new product to market. What happens and what we learned when we were trying to figure out why there weren't more fintech integrations happening within the space is that the business unit would get super excited, have meeting after meeting after meeting with the fintech, the fintech gets super excited, and then guess what? We've got to go to legal, and we have to go to compliance. And I don't know how many people have thought of the compliance area is where products go to die. Um, but unfortunately, compliance does have that uh, kind of uh, name about them. There's a way to change that, though, right? Compliance is really only trying to do their job. This is they're trying to protect the financial institution. Bring them in early, and people always shudder when I say that. It works. If you bring legal and compliance into those discussions early, they can help solve the problem instead of having the problem identified too, so late that there's nothing that they can do about it. And it's super fun to be involved in those conversations. Compliance people don't often get invited to the table. Invite them to the table. Let them help you solve, identify what's, what the challenges are going to be within the organization, what they have to do, and then you can work together on finding the solution. And the same goes for legal. Um, bring them in early to see if there's anything from a legal perspective that is going to keep that partnership from happening. Find out early. There may be things that you can't work around. That way you haven't spent numerous meetings with a financial institution before finding these things out. I'd also, yes? And I'm not sure, can our online group hear those questions that come from the audience? Or do you want me to repeat them? So uh, thank you very much. The comment was, have a visual for legal and compliance in other areas. They really, that really helps them identify. They're not always in the product development space. So if you can give them that visual, that goes a long way. And I know through the work that we're doing with BECU as, as part of, uh, of the accelerator program, we have had to do that. So thanks to Alicia, we've already gone through developing that and giving really the flow of what that looks like. So thank you for that. Uh, other areas to also make sure that you involve that are often not thought of um, kind of early on are uh, other key business lines. So how will this impact other areas within the bank? Are there key business lines that we need to be aware of? 
really look at defining your rules of engagement for how you're going to work with a financial institution. Uh, discuss the realistic expectations, and by realistic, I mean realistic for both sides, uh, not just for one side as far as what those are. Uh, look at resources. Resources are a drain on both sides. Uh, financial institutions often think fintechs have unlimited resource, tons of VC funding, all these engineers, um, and can just wait, wait, wait it out for them. Uh, on the other side, I think fintechs often uh, underestimate the, the, the time constraints that are on individuals within a financial institution and the competing priorities that they have. So be really careful about making sure that you're, you're having those conversations early about expectations on each side, uh, about what implementations look like, timelines, uh, that type of process. Also talk about your goals and your metrics early on. You want to know and set realistic goals and metrics, and you want to make sure that both sides are aligned. This comes back to terminology. Understand what is meant by each side as far as a goal and a metric. And then what happens, who's responsible for those goals? And then what happens if they aren't met? Right? We don't want a lot of finger pointing going back and forth. That leads to deterioration of the partnership and then a lack of trust. So if something, uh, we know clearly who, who has the goal, what the responsibility is, what happens if it isn't met, how we adjust and reframe, that will go a long way in working with, uh, with the partner. And it can also be extremely helpful, depending on where your product sits uh, within the financial institution and the size of the organization, to have organizational buy-in uh, from, the, from the top level. So, are, do you have organizational buy-in from the C-suite? Does the board buy, buy into it? Is the board aware of what's happening? That all helps with rollouts within the financial institution. And we all know if there's support from the C-suite coming throughout the organization, then that filters into goals and to metrics of people within the organization. And then there is more support for your product rollout. That may not be necessary in every case. Find out if it is necessary in your case and then what you can do and, and, and how you can go about getting that. <sighs> Risk and compliance. Not everybody's favorite topic to talk about, but it is so embedded into the financial institution space, which gets me back to talking about why you have to be passionate about this space. Um, because risk and compliance is something that is just part of the, being, being within this ecosystem. You really can help a financial institution out by working with them and understanding what their risk and compliance, uh, what their risk tolerance is, and what you need to do in order to help them as far as working through any documentation that you need. This is a highly regulated environment. I don't have to tell you all that. It can get frustrating on the FinTech side in order to help a financial institution comply with it. It is not their fault. They are, they are regulated and they need to comply with everything that's coming their way. So be sure that you're working closely with them. You can actually make this easier for them. You can provide them with documentation that they need. You can let them know what types of certifications you have, what you are doing to be compliant on your end. If you're handling customer information, how you're handling that. So, be, again, an advocate for them, understand where they're coming from, and embed this into your own ecosystem as far as risk and compliance. Don't wait for them to ask. They're going to ask. They're going to need it. So be proactive in working with them on that. Uh, you can also work with the regulators. Again, it, there, there was a time where a lot of fintechs didn't want to talk to regulators because then it felt like, well, now I'm telling you what, you're do what I'm doing and now you're going to start to come after me because you don't think I, I, I'm in the right space. That's shifting a little bit. There, there's, there's still, um, when, you're, when you're working with a regulator, you, you still have to really look at how you're talking with them and what you're sharing with them. However, it is important for them to know what you're doing. They, some regulators do have fintech office hours. Uh, if they have those, see if you can take advantage of those. See if you can attend, see if you can go. If not, you may want to set up individual meetings with them. Or if you really have a strong partnership with a financial institution, work with them to see, hey, how would you recommend? And do you think we're ready to go and talk to a regulator? And is this something we would do with you? Or should we do it on our own? How, how do you recommend that, that we do that? 
A regulator is not going to, quote, endorse your product. That is just not going to happen. However, they will ask questions, and you can listen to the questions that they're asking, and you can share that information back with financial institutions when you go to meet with them. Hey, we met with this regulator. This, these are some of the questions that came up. Uh, where This is how we're addressing them, or we had a really good conversation. Again, it's not an endorsement. They will not do that. It's just industry awareness and learnings. Vendor due diligence and contracts. Uh, vendor due diligence is something that varies between financial institutions. So you may have put together vendor due diligence information already. If you have, it may work at one institution and another institution may want additional information. Don't get frustrated with them. Again, just realize different processes at different institutions. This, you can, you can also be very helpful to the institution in this case by sharing um, any information that you have with them up front. Again, going back to what kind of security documents do you have? Uh, there, there's a, uh, there's a, a number of, of pieces of information that they need as part of their vendor due diligence program. Ask them what those are and get those to them. I know um, Pocket Nest uh, is here with us today and they have put together what you call your trust Trust Center. So that is uh, within your ecosystem, and then you can just make that available to financial institutions so they can come into that and grab the due diligence information that they need. It's a freestanding website, so okay. it's just Okay. So again, well, that is a freestanding website that they have, uh, pocketnest.com, and they can go in, request the information. Of course, you have to okay that, and then for anything of the other secure documents, um, then, then they go through you in order to, to get that information. That's an example of being extremely proactive within the marketplace and making it easy for the financial institution to go in and gather what they want. Um, at ASA, we, we put together our own due diligence packet, so we proactively share that out with financial institutions who we think are getting closer to partnership so that they can have all of that information instead of them having to come to us and ask us for it. Really, when you're looking, uh, as you're getting further into that product development piece, start to really talk with them about what terms of a contract may look like. So you may want to do a term sheet. You may want to start having uh, contract conversations. The reason that I say to do this early on is the financial institution may have different expectations than you do as far as what the relationship looks like and what the partnership looks like. Uh, if you're a fintech and you're, you're just going out to market, you may offer early sign-on uh, financial institutions. They may get a benefit over some of those financial institutions who sign on later. So maybe it's a pilot contract. Maybe there's something that they, they get as far as helping you along with product development. And then financial institutions who sign on later don't get that same benefit. The financial institution, though, may think they're an early sign-on, and they may be working with you in good faith thinking they're getting a benefit of being one of those early or pilot ones when they really aren't. Again, that can really cause a partnership to fall apart, and you've put months into product development with them, only to find out later that, again, on those terms, there was a misunderstanding as far as what the terms of the contract were going to be. So I believe it's very helpful to have those conversations early on. When you look at ongoing partnership relationship management, this is where I see a lot of challenges within the marketplace. So everybody's excited. We got the product to market. Uh, and then what happens next? Right, so the financial institution is running it. Uh, we may, as fintechs, be off doing something else, working with another partner, trying to get them to market. And we've kind of just left the financial institution out there on their own. So really, fintechs, make sure that you have somebody within your organization who is responsible for the ongoing management of that partnership and work with the financial institution to really understand what that looks like uh, as far as how do we want to make sure that that relationship keeps going, do we have monthly check-ins, uh, how are we getting customer feedback from you? Because there may be pivots that you need to make within your product, and if you're not hearing back from them, you won't know about that. They're gonna be frustrated because they're gonna say the product failed, and there was something easy that you could have done on your side. I say easy, <laughs> it's just a flip of a switch. Uh, but there may be something that you could have done on your side in order to help them along. So that ongoing communication is extremely important. 
backing up before you, you get to that point. It's really important, we were talking about key areas within the bank uh, to make sure that are involved. Marketing and communications is one of them. As you get further on down the road, but before you go to product launch, you need to make sure that marketing and communications are involved. And this is from both your side, as, but mainly from, from the financial institution point of view. Marketing can be extremely helpful. Again, if they understand the product and buy into it, they can help you with messaging. They can help you with going to market. They will also be your advocate internally for making sure that the internal financial institution team is aware of the rollout and understands what's going on. If they find out about product rollout a week before it's supposed to launch, they're going to be very frustrated. It's another thing that's been added to their plate, and they won't be as much of an ad advocate for you because they won't have had time to creatively think about what they need to do in order to have the rollout happen. Another area to make sure that is involved is training. Does your product require any internal training within the financial institution? And if so, how is that going to happen? Different financial institutions have different ways of training their teams and bringing that product out to market and then also internally. So you need to make sure that they are involved and that they understand what is happening so that you have that buy-in. Marketing within some institutions also has to go through legal. So depending on how backed up legal is, your product rollout could be delayed because you can't get your marketing language approved in order to go to market. So another reason that it's really important to bring marketing in early, and again, some of the training areas and the other areas within the bank. We had, uh, I learned from, from one of our banks as they were rolling out, they were at this point, they were ready to go to market, they, had, they were celebrating because uh, they, were, they were rolling it out uh, kind of on Monday, so there was a big company-wide celebration about bringing this new fintech in and rolling the product to market. Guess who wasn't informed of the product rollout? Anybody? CEO. No. The fintech? No. Within the, within the financial institution is a tough one. The call center. So the company's celebrating, and guess what the call center had to do? They had to work over the weekend to try to understand the product in order to be able to field the calls that were going to be coming in from their customers and members regarding the new product. So while the company is celebrating, uh, this particular uh, banker who was rolling this out has felt terrible, right? They had missed a key component, a key area within the financial institution as far as rolling this out. And who's, who's in the call center? Your customer-facing people. So what are they going to be saying to people who are calling in, right? If they're not so happy about having to work the weekend, they might not be as excited about the product. So your whole rollout on that key pivot can really change. So just some things to keep in mind as you're working through different areas. The internal, I think we, we often think about the external marketing and what that works out. The internal marketing within that branch, uh, within that institution and the training is just as important as well because those are your front facing people and they do need to understand uh, uh, what's going on and how, how, how they can answer questions that come up to them and really be an advocate for you within the industry. Um, we talked a little bit just about the ongoing research as far as making sure that uh, you're having that, those conversations back with the financial institution once you have rolled that out. So make sure that you've got a really great way to understand what they're hearing back, what is the feedback mechanism for that sharing that information with you, and then how do you share ongoing research and insights that you're gaining as you're rolling out with other institutions. Institution, financial institutions love to hear what other financial institutions are doing. So if you can share best practices of what worked with this one, uh, this is how this rollout went, this is what we need to change. Don't you know, share what you know. You can say this didn't work. That's okay. Financial institutions aren't going to get upset with you because something didn't work. They'd rather know what didn't work and then be able to adapt and change with you along the way. So really take a look at that and make sure that you continue to do that. Those are some of the kind of key insights and key points that I've gained from, from being in this space. And I hope that has helped shed some insight for all of you as you go into uh, wherever you are in your joint journey as far as working with financial institutions. It's a really exciting time to be in this space. Uh, I love the partnerships that we have with financial institutions. Financial institutions are doing so many great things within the industry and within the community, and you all can really help make a difference and help them do that. 
I will say if we have any customer facing fintechs in the audience, please talk with me or one of my teammates after uh, the session because a lot of what I have just talked about here today, we can help you solve a lot of those problems as we go to market. We can help you um, not have to deal with a lot of, uh, of the challenges that, that are in the marketplace uh, that you would have to deal with through our platform in which we connect customer facing fintechs with account holders through their financial institution in a secure and compliant marketplace. And with that, I will open up to any questions. more tactical than we should be, but um, can you talk a little bit about pen test and uh, SOC 2 and when that is appropriate? Uh, I can get a little bit into that. We do have our CTO here, so uh, he might want to talk a little bit more about what we've done from our perspective. Uh, it has to do with really when you're looking at um, how far along you are in product development and what's required from, from the bank. After, are you touching customer information? What type of security systems are they going to need you to have in place depending on the data that, that you have? So I would say it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a challenge, right? Because they're, they're not inexpensive to go down the path of getting those. So you have to look again at what is your runway and where do you want to where do you want to have those in place however I would say the earlier that you can start if you do need them the better because that is going to then help you get to uh, implementation with a financial institution that much more quickly because you already have those in place that's my high level answer Troy do you have anything to add but just the main thing about compliance is oh yeah sure just the main thing about compliance is whether or not it represents a barrier to being able to work with uh, entities that you need to work with. So in the banking space, SOC 2 is viewed as a chevron that, oh, okay, these guys must know what they're doing technically and security and everything else. It's, it's a, it's, it can be a barrier to entry or moving forward because then they've got to do a full analysis on your tech stack, everything else. And they say, well, do you really have all the processes? Are you supporting the regulations correctly? So depending on what you need to go to market will determine on what compliance you do need in place and what programs you need to follow. For us, SOC 2 Type 2 was achieved prior to initial MVP launch. And the reason was so that we could take that discussion off the table with the FIs and immediately say, hey, listen, we're SOC 2 Type 2. We already are working on PCI compliance. We've, we're working on uh, uh, CCPA and some other privacy initiatives. So all of those discussions then become simple for them because it's something that they already know and are familiar with. It does take, uh, speaking for Troy, it does take a lot of time. And so it's also a resource issue on your end. Uh, but for us, yeah, it was imperative that we have it. So that will slow in order to, to, to put it in place. By slow, I mean a, a time resource, right? However, it will speed us up now as far as going, going to implementation. Hi, one of the, um, the it seemed like the central message in a lot of what you said for startups is that they don't always realize that a financial institution is a very diverse institution. There are a lot of competing interests. Sometimes they conflict with each other. And it's very valuable, particularly at the beginning, to learn a lot from different people within the organization that you're targeting. And what I was wondering, if you have any tips for people who are in a startup that's at the very outset, maybe they're looking at their first financial institution to bring on as a client, how do they establish relationships throughout that organization to get that information? So I would say you start with your, your key point of contact uh, within that organization, right? The one who brought you in uh, as far as the product development and ask them to say who else should we be in touch with within the organization? How can we bring in some of these other key areas? And is that something that I do through you? Or is that something that you can connect me with and do it? And can, is that something where then, like, can I give you a presentation that you can share around? Ask them on how best to work within their organization in order to gain those. It, that's, my, that's my advice in the beginning. And then and I don't know if you're going on site at all, um, if that's happening or not. Uh, if you are, though, what you could say is, 
hey, I'd love to come and do a site visit with you. And at that point, could, can I meet some of the other people within the organization? Could we have a meeting with legal compliance? You know, if you feel it's appropriate, and can we bring them all in? I can do a product brief, and they can ask questions, and we can talk about how we're working together. I was just going to add to that, I'm also with ASA, and w before we started building or writing any code, um, we interviewed 150 CEOs of financial institutions and made um, several key pivots to the way we were going to build the product. So we found out that what initially we wanted to do was not going to work in the market, and we were able to save significant time and resources by talking to a large number of institutions as an early company. From the internet, how has your experience played into your time with the fintech incubator with BECU? Could you comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. And this um, is also something that I'll, I'll just say is if, if as a you all you're all here, so you're doing this um, for for people who are attending virtually, this is also to your question a, a, a fantastic way to meet and know other people within the financial institution. So within BECU, as far as being part of this accelerator program, we have our key points of contact. However, Alicia and team are introducing us to other points of contact within BECU. So we're getting advice from them kind of from, as, a, as a startup saying, hey, how would you, if, could somebody within your team look at our legal contracts and let us know what you think? Can somebody look at our marketing and tell us from a marketing perspective? We know what we think and we're working with some of our other financial institutions. However, as part of the accelerator program, we'd like that feedback. So we are working with the ECU in those ways to really validate the product uh, we want to run through the compliance. We want to understand what kind of questions uh, they're going to have. So we really look at that as a partnership and helping us go to market with, with our product based on the insight and what we can learn from the team within BECU. And again, to your point, that's helping us meet other people. We're not going, you know, as we're working with them as far as the incubator program. So for us, it's been extremely valuable. Uh, we've gotten to meet all of you who are here, which is really nice too. So we're meeting other fintechs within the industry. Uh, we're, we're getting to find out more about BCU, BECU and how they work. And then they're able to give us advice as we, as we look at going to market. So it's been an extremely valuable relationship for us. Okay. Last chance for questions? I have a question. Could you recommend a book that you are currently reading? It doesn't have to be right on this topic, okay. but something that's been of interest to you. Just like any book? Your choice. Okay. Speaker's choice. Gosh, I have so many. <laughs> <laughs> All right, not related to this space, but a, a book that I find um, fascinating just as far as where we are today uh, as a country is a book called Deacon King Kong. Has anybody read that in here? Okay. Next time I meet with you all, let's discuss. <laughs> All right, we're just gonna we're gonna wrap up here. Thank you, Lisa, um, and that is thank you all for joining us today. And a big thank you to Lisa for sharing her wisdom um, and experience with the group. As a reminder, next Friday at noon, we'll be hearing from Karen Kidder, who will present Early Stage Investing 101. Sign up for that, and we'll see you all next week. Thank you.